We'll get started on Beyond BI, Becoming the Data Analyst of the Future. My name is Caitlin Bigsby. I'm Head of Product Marketing here at Virtualytics. And I'm joined today by Joseph Oliveira, uh, Solutions Engineer. And we are going to be uh, taking you through sort of the evolving uh, need for more advanced skills in the with amongst data analysts with today's uh, complexity of data. Thank you very much for joining again and for uh, completing our poll question as you joined. Uh, Tiffany, can we take a look at the, the answers we got from that, that poll question? Or maybe not, it's fine. <laughs> we'll take a look a little later. There they are. Okay, we asked how you, how would you describe your organization's data maturity today? Uh, the majority of you say that you are advanced or strategic. Uh, data collection is comprehensive, real-time and automated high data quality standards, robust data cleansing and validation. That's great. That means you're really, really well positioned to start doing a lot more with your data and really advancing your data analyst forwards. Uh, the rest of the team, we got a good chunk of people in that intermediate proactive stage, becoming more systemic, becoming and you know, improving your integrations between systems. Quality is priority, but there's still you're still working on that single source of truth. And just a little bit more of a quarter is are people who are still a bit reactive. They would describe themselves a bit reactive, a bit more ad hoc um, and minimal focus. But the good news is you can see there's there's a lot of potential to start moving forward. But this was a really great snapshot of people attending today. Thank you very much for those who participated. All right, let's move along. So we're going to talk first um, a little bit about the evolution of the analyst and um, about the need for the, the role of the analyst to evolve as our changing needs and the changing business landscape really evolves. Uh, we worked with CIO.com and did a survey of leaders of data science and data analytics to uh, try to get a sense of where the average data analyst was in their maturity and their ability to work with complex data. And what a future might look like uh, if we were to increase the skill set of this particular group of people. And what we got, again, when we started asking questions about the success of database projects and what I would include in database projects is, of course, AI, but but anything else that's really built on um, with data as a foundation, maybe making data a uh, a foundation of decision making, for example, or um, really trying to integrate it into to bigger bigger functions in the business, is uh, forty eight percent of these leaders were saying they were still getting inaccurate results from their data. Forty eight percent were still experiencing a lot of project delays and um, and problems just getting things done on time and out the door and into production. And uh, fifty three percent were saying they're getting a lack of actionable results from AI and analytic problem uh, projects. This has been sort of a really tenacious problem. It's been um, something that Gartner's been talking about for a while, this lack of actionability and lack of results from these big database projects. So it's still really hard to start to really push forward the value and get some traction with these things. Um, AI projects specifically are not necessarily achieving that promise um, to and getting off the ground. 60% um, are saying they're having a hard time even finding use cases for problems that can be solved with AI. So there's a lot of pressure from above to use AI, um, but a lot of problems finding where AI can be used effectively. And 45% say that their business stakeholders don't understand. And when your business stakeholders don't understand what you are doing, you're going to have problems, again, with adoption, with traction, getting the feedback that you need to create a, an impactful application to move forward. So there's still a lot of talking across purposes, not really understanding what's necessary, not really being able to, to, to get at the root of the problem. Um, and analysts are really struggling to get at the complex insights. So if you move the layer below, like why, why are we seeing these problems um, uh, reaching success with, with uh, data problem uh, projects? You have analysts that are unable to explore more than a handful of data points at any given time. So they're missing that bigger picture of that interaction and interconnectedness between various parts of the organization. 43% uh, can't sift through large volumes of data to get at the insight. And the fact of the matter is the volume of data we're collecting is increasing constantly. There is just still so much data to get at, but we're not able to dig through it to get at those bits of value that will help us identify use cases that will work, will help us point us in the right direction uh, to create impact, to create get accurate results. And 
these leaders that we surveyed, 64% of them said that data exploration is being held back by a lack of data science skills. And there's such demand for data science skills uh, and that those kind of skill sets are being funneled into really the, you know, the high value projects were actually leaving a big part of the foundation sort of unsupported by, by these skill sets to really get at the, the, the foundation that, that everything is built upon. And again, of this, this group, uh, they said only a quarter of their data analysts had advanced analytics skills. Uh, so right now we can see that there's uh, maybe not enough skill out there, but there's also, I think we can look at it as representative of a lot of untapped potential. These are, uh, there's a large group of people that we can start to bring up a level. We can find ways to support them and move them forward and to actually start to contribute early on in the process of advanced data science projects uh, to give them more value, uh, to really leverage their connection with the business uh, and then empower them with skills to do uh, advanced analytic work that will make all the difference in moving those projects along and moving them towards value. So we have one more, another survey question. We could get that up. This question is sort of what do you feel like the the uh, average analytic uh, capability of the business analysts you work with look like? We have the historic reporting and dashboard, maybe moderate analytics and statistical testing, and more advanced analytics, applied AI and predictive analytics. We'll give everybody a moment to uh, to respond, and then we will uh, see what people have to say and keep on moving. All right, I'm uh, I'm relying on my assistant to to watch the results and uh, to make the make the call when we can display these and take a look. Let's let's see what people had to say. Yeah, sixty six percent of you are saying most of the experiences with historic reporting or dashboarding, um, with twenty two percent at moderate and thirteen percent at advanced, and that's what we see a lot of. Um, and that's really where where the focus has been for such a long time. Uh, so it's it's not really a surprise, but again, I think it speaks to maybe a lot of potential to bring them forward, but um, let's look at how we can do that. All right. So what you're going to see I'm building on front of you on screen, I think maybe some of you have seen this, um, the analytic maturity curve before from descriptive to diagnostic to predictive to prescriptive. I wish to break these out as basic analytics, the what was and what is in advanced analytics, what will be and and what should be done about it. Um, this is often sort of shown to us as this like natural stepping stone. One leads to the next, leads to the next. If you get really good at descriptive, the natural next move is to diagnostic. And then the suggestion is from diagnostic, the next not natural step is to prescriptive. But in fact, what you see in the middle between basic analytics and advanced analytics is an increase in the types of data that you need to work with, the data complexity that you need to work with, that interplay between the data. So that is those, um, you know, the correlations, the causations, the, the touch points, you know, where, where three things coming together are significant, but on their own, they don't mean anything. Um, you also, because you are looking, when you're looking at a predictive or prescriptive model, you are actually, uh, you need a lot more business buy-in. You're actually sort of creating more of an app. You need more change management. You need the business really to be on board with adopting it. So that's a lot more significant than it is with descriptive or diagnostic. And finally, the potential impact, both positive and negative of adopting advanced analytics is a lot more significant. So there's really quite a big chasm between these two kinds of analytics. They require different foundations to be successful. They, they both do start with that access to data. So, you know, good news seeing how many of you are, are really proactive about your data management strategy. They, that they all have in common. But once you get past that, it does start to look a little different. Basic analytics is very well supported with um, analysis and then visualization of the simple data. Um, and this stuff has been done really well by analytic dashboards and um, BI and visualizations tools. They, they kind of get to the heart of matter and these tools are evolving and, and to make them a little bit more simple. But in fact, they are still very much focused on this descriptive and diagnostic side of the house. But when you start talking about advanced analytics, they require a lot more deep exploration and understanding of the data. The data is already, as I said, more complex. It has more data types. There's more going on in there. Uh, and you need to get a little bit deeper into the heart of the matter to see what's going on and to see what the potential is. You know, recall from a little bit earlier, uh, a good number of people, 60% of organizations are struggling simply to find use cases. And uh, maybe that's because their scope of exploration is still really quite limited. 
uh, because there's actually a lack of suitable solutions to do this kind of complex exploration. So it's either not being done or people are trying to, you know, take a whole bunch of dashboards of different um, one of analyses and trying to connect the dots across the board and see if there's a there there. Um, and it's really, really hard to get that that sense of what's going on that you need, that complex understanding that you need. I, furthermore, um, it's not always about AI. Sometimes it's just simply about a more complex understanding for uh, a better report, a better decision. Um, and you still need to communicate those discoveries up a level. And when you can't actually find them, you're obviously not communicating them. Or if you're finding them trying to use these cobbled together tools that are really don't paint a really clear picture, even if one or two people maybe understand what's happening, it's still really difficult to communicate that up a level to the people who need to make a decision uh, about the next steps. So then what you have happening is you still have some projects moving forward because there's such demand and pressure to move forward with AI projects, but they're sort of built um, upon a nothing. They're a little bit built on a, on a house of cards and they don't really have that support and the strategy of knowing that you've come to the right conclusions to move forward with. So there's this great big gap there and it's really leaving uh, our strategies unsupported. And it's really um, explains a lot about why we're not still not seeing all the results that we wanna be seeing in um, advanced data strategies. But there's also another good reason to simply expand this uh, scope of exploration is with BI, you have to know what to look for and what to do your report on. Um, we're all doing the same reports on the same KPIs that everybody's been reporting on for that many years. But business is complex. The margins for success and advancement are really narrow, and they require people doing something a little bit different, something a little bit outside the norm. But if we're all looking at the same thing, we're all doing the same thing. Whereas when we expand that scope of exploration, we discover new opportunities to pull ahead. Again, whether that opportunity is to leverage AI in a way that we hadn't thought of before, or whether it's simply about doing X instead of Y, the Y that we have been doing all this time and just trying to do Y a bit better when we could have been doing X all along. And when you expand the capacity of your data analyst to explore, you have the opportunity to really pull ahead. So if analysts that have advanced data exploration capabilities, uh, are in a good position to provide guidance for decisions that touch complex relationships. So they are, again, they're positioned with the business and that business relationship and understanding. Uh, when you fold in a better understanding and better exploration of complex data, they can help support uh, complex decisions. They can discover new KPIs or new opportunities for success or new things that maybe indicate success or failure a little bit earlier down the road. So course correction can happen or, or taking advantage of things can happen a little bit earlier um, and maybe streamline some of the those uh, dashboards that we have uh, piling on everybody, maybe find out what really is important to look at and not a million different things at once. They can discover and vet opportunities for enterprise AI. They can, um, in the course of their exploration, maybe they discover there's one different way to do things, or maybe they can see a really great opportunity to automate or uh, advance and put in, in predictions and then bring the data science team in to work on a project that's already been vetted, that already has the buy-in of the business. And they can uncover simply new and novel opportunities to optimize the business. With that expanded scope and understanding, they can uh, provide more value in the role that they're already in. Again, from that same CIO.com survey, we found that leaders anticipated that providing advanced analytics skills to their analyst is going to drive AI and data maturity. We found a correlation. I will acknowledge this is a correlation, not necessarily causation, but that organizations um, that didn't have a mature data powered strategy, only 6% of their data analysts uh, had advanced analytics skills. Compared to those organizations that had a very mature, robust um, data powered uh, program, 56% of their analysts had these advanced skills. So there's definitely a relationship here between what the analysts are capable of and the maturity of the, the data programs. So here are some three benefits to explore um, improving the, the exploration capabilities of your analysts. Improve decision-making uh, capabilities because they will have done a more comprehensive analysis. They'll be able to take into account more relationships, more variables, um, rather than just the obvious ones that stick out. Um, you're going to get more value out of the data that you collect, particularly that external data when you can um, explore broader and faster and, and um, with with 
deeper data sets, uh, you can actually start to get a lot more value out of this, this data and more value out of your investments in your current data infrastructure. So it's going to make the entire data function a lot more valuable when you have people that can do, do more. So we're going to move into optimizing exploration, how to get more out of your exploration capabilities. And then we're going to talk through some actual techniques and capabilities uh, for exploring using AI. Before we start this topic, though, um, well, we're going to start here with that uh, proper exploration is necessary to find the right problem. So again, if we're all looking in the same place, we're going to find the same KPIs. Um, but if we have a better solution that helps us expand our reach, we're going to be able to actually look at the right problem. Uh, this happens a lot when people are are focusing on one area that they think is the problem to the neglect of everything around it. Um, they're maybe fixing the thing that actually isn't the problem in the first place. So expanding that scope brings in more opportunities and, and more opportun opportunities to discover the problem that is actually at the heart of things. So let's start with our, our last survey question, and then I'm going to hand it over to Joseph to talk about some techniques. So our last one is, how do you currently explore data, complex data sets with dozens to hundreds of attributes that could possibly impact a business challenge? Uh, do you use spreadsheets and, and graphs, um, BI tools, custom solutions, um, or do you have any you know, code or processes that you've developed in-house or other? What uh, is currently happening at your organization right now? Recognize this is a very broad problem it, uh, question. It probably means different people are doing different things. But if we're, we're thinking about, broadly speaking, how complex data sets are explored, let's see what you're currently using. All right, let's take a look. Yeah, spreadsheets, um, Expel, that's definitely in there, and BI tools. So yeah, a lot of a lot of the cases we're still using those really traditional tool sets um, designed for, for BI and understanding for, for that complex exploration uh, with a handful of things elsewhere. A good chunk of people using code or processes developed in-house. Okay, I'm going to pass the floor over to Joseph, uh, who will talk in about how to optimize exploration. Yeah, hi, everyone, and, and thank you for attending our webinar here. Uh, so I think where a good place to start for optimizing exploration is just level setting on uh, the principles of data exploration here. So where we're beginning is honing in on the question. So desp despite the many industries that I'm sure you all come from, this is still uh, a very important thing. You get a question from the business, from a stakeholder, and naturally that question needs to be interpreted into some analytical question, some analytical problem or problem statement. And so the question needs to evolve. What are we trying to understand and how do we measure it today? Are there KPIs that exist? Are there business processes that aim to measure it? And then finally, how do we then convert the answer that we're going to get from asking this question into value, into action uh, that will actually drive value in the business and, and aim to solve that problem? And so with that, um, the KPI is of the utmost importance. Does your KPI match your question? Uh, and once you have identified that KPI, what tools do you have at your disposal? Uh, there are two uh, main tools that or two uh, buckets of tools that we can use today. Unsupervised machine learning are are tools that help you discover patterns where you don't know initially where to look for those patterns, or maybe uh, when you don't have one KPI that measures a business process. For example, uh, customer segmentation is a common uh, problem to answer with unsupervised machine learning techniques. And then also, if you have a single KPI like customer lifetime value, uh, well, you can use supervised machine learning techniques to help you understand that. So in optimizing data exploration, uh, we want to jump right into just start understanding the data context here. So understanding what your KPI represents is, is very important. So within a CBG retail organization, for example, it might be the number of units sold. Uh, taking this value at face met uh, taking this metric at face value uh, might neglect the number of uh, product units that were returned or the number of units that were given away free in promotion. So understanding your KPI, understanding what it represents, the nuances to it, it's incredibly important. Another item to make sure is what other features are related to your KPI. Again, if we're going with the number of units sold at a CPG organization, uh, then related uh, uh, features to your KPI 
might include the, the price of the product that was sold. Uh, if that product was sold in a promotion, like a buy one, get one deal, uh, the advertising budget that marketing used to promote that product, uh, dimensions of the product, any other features that help uh, distinguish it from its competitors. And of course, seasonality. Uh, if your KPI is trending upward uh, and, it, and you're in CPG space, you would expect that to trend upward during the holiday season as opposed uh, to during the off season. Does your KPI stem from a business process? It's important to understand uh, what exists today to generate that value. Is it, uh, is it a measurement that comes from uh, a spreadsheet? Is it a measurement that's uh, coming from the point of sale? Uh, is it uh, a measurement that comes from a system of a system? Uh, understanding that context is important for using the KPI uh, intelligently. And then how is that KPI measured? Uh, I mentioned this just a moment ago, but point of sales one way, survey, sales data, is it coming from your CRM tool or ERP? Uh, this is important to uh, understanding that, that context, how that answer comes together and how it might drive value in your business. Uh, one of the most important uh, things to understand is how other features might skew uh, your KPI. So for example, if you're considering um, users visiting your website and measuring how long they spend perusing your site. Uh, it's important to know how long it takes for your site to load. Uh, if you notice that their average dwell time is trending upward, you might at face value consider it to be a really good thing. Maybe uh, you did some changes to the website and people are spending longer exploring your uh, product catalog but that might also be due to longer load time. So other features might skew that KPI and having that context is important for arriving at a, a proper conclusion. And then finally, does the target KPI align with your business goals? Uh, this is critical because ultimately uh, it's misguided to uh, answer a business question with a KPI that doesn't exactly address uh, the, the business context there. Once you have that KPI and once you're pulling together data uh, from wherever it lives, it's prudent to do a data sanity check. Uh, and there are many ways to do that today from dashboard to spreadsheet. Uh, but in short, uh, what that involves is looking at you know, the distribution of the numeric features or how your categorical features are broken out. It's not uncommon that you have categorical features that are coded as numeric, such as zip code or uh, monetary values that are coded as ca uh, categorical due to the dollar sign symbol. Uh, and so just having that sanity check up front prevents a lot of uh, pain and headache at the end of uh, your data exploration. So doing all this upfront work allows you to then iterate often and iterate efficiently in your data exploration. So assessing if results fit within an existing framework is a good check to see, for example, if your sales spike, did it spike because of a marketing campaign effort or is this an organic increase in traffic? Also understanding how outcomes of a feature impact analysis may change when certain features are included. We'll talk a little bit about this technique in the, uh, in the next couple of slides, but understanding how your features are impacting your KPI, how uh, different columns in your data set are related to that KPI is important, but also understanding how they might interact with each other uh, to impact that KPI is, is also relevant. And we'll see here maybe how removing persistent features such as where customers live or brand loyalty, features that you can't control might impact uh, your KPI. And lastly here, determining if features are independent from one another uh, and unpacking how features might be correlated with each other or uh, ideally independent of one another. It's important to doing any type of analysis. Of course, uh, if uh, you have features that are correlated, it might not be obvious at first. Uh, so for example, product sizing uh, might correlate to how customers are consuming that product. Um, but initially, when you're working with data, that might not be apparent. And so here we're going to relate these techniques uh, back to 
uh, how we can optimize our data exploration. Uh, and so the first technique we're going to talk about is a feature impact analysis. Uh, and this is a critical technique to do at the beginning of any data exploration. So um, many of us are used to dashboards. We jump in, we have our KPIs listed along the top, um, but kind of pausing and asking, why are these the KPIs we're tracking? Why are these the features that we're tracking uh, is important. So feature impact analysis is a supervised machine learning technique that lets you rank the impact of your data features against that KPI to let you figure out what should be the top level metrics that you're tracking in your dashboard. So you do this to explain to stakeholders uh, what features matter and, and what features are impacting that key metric that they're interested in tracking. You also do this to, as you begin your data exploration to determine where that signal resides and to narrow, narrow your feature space down to just a handful of data features that would be the most impactful on that metric. In the Virtualytics platform, we implement feature impact analysis through our patented smart mapping. And the way that works uh, is that we're able to evaluate how features are impacting your KPI, whatever that might be. Then we use that information to generate several data visualizations. And we recommend our AI system recommends that back to you to begin your data exploration. All of this can be automatically done and exported out of the platform. We can suggest numerical drivers, categorical drivers, as well as geospatial plots to help you understand how this, how these results uh, are actually interacting with each other and interacting with that KPI. And both linear and nonlinear relationships are considered. Of course, if you're just doing a correlation analysis today, you're missing out on nonlinear relationships in your data. Another technique here is interaction analysis. So here, uh, understanding how features are interacting with each other such that the KPI value is significantly different or significantly affected. Uh, so some of, uh, you might have ran into this as just an interaction effects analysis as well. We do this to see if there are any significant interactions that it might be insightful to the business and insightful for the business to understand. Characterizing these interactions might also lead to the implementation of business practices um, or overall uh, insights that might lead to action to drive value. The way that Virtualytics implements the interaction analysis is through our automated insights routine, which for different plot types is able to generate different results. So for scatter plots, we're able to highlight regions of uh, the plot related to statistically significant distributions of data related to that KPI. Uh, we're doing the same for histograms where we can identify regions of value where uh, certain histogram bins have a large amount of a certain KPI value. And for time series and line plots, we're able to uh, do a correlation analysis among multiple series of data, highlighting which ones are correlated and how so. Anomaly detection helps us identify statistical outliers or extreme values in our data for a combination of features or for a single feature. It's especially, it's especially useful when the extreme data points are not visually obvious. And this might happen where you might have several hundred columns that you're, uh, that you're ingesting and the outlier might exist within a subset of 50 columns. Uh, for us, we're able to implement this through uh, a couple of different techniques here through either a threshold-based anomaly detection where uh, we're using PCA to look at the large subset of features uh, that comprise that feature space for your anomalies, but then also a traditional anomaly detection technique using standard deviations uh, to flag outliers as well. And so when to use either of these techniques, uh, you would use threshold uh, anomaly detection when uh, you're looking for anomalies across a very wide data set, and there isn't any obvious column or feature uh, that might indicate that anomalous value. And the standard deviation approach might be more suitable when you're 
looking for anomalies in a much smaller subset of your data, uh, say two or three columns, and if, if they follow a normal distribution as well. Another technique to use in data exploration is clustering. Uh, and so clustering is a technique, it's an unsupervised learning technique uh, that is based on numerical similarity. And in our platform, we're able to very quickly do clustering, flag those results, uh, and export them out. Uh, these can be used to identify customer segments, to categorize new products, um, categorize IT tickets based on common problems. Uh, overall, detecting these segments, uh, if, there's an, if there's ever a business uh, problem where you're looking for patterns in your data, clustering is a go-to in data exploration. So how does clustering work? Uh, <clears throat> there are multiple techniques for clustering. Uh, K-means uh, is a very common technique and one that we've implemented in the Virtualytics platform. Uh, works with numerical features and <clears throat> determining how many clusters to look for in your data might come from using a, a, a technique known as the elbow method to figure out the stable number of clusters uh, in your data that's being detected. Another unsupervised learning technique that uh, is useful in complex data exploration is principal component analysis. Uh, this is especially useful when working with data sets that have several hundreds of features, and it reduces those hundreds of features down to three or four features that you can then embed in a machine learning algorithm. PCA is a, is a statistical technique <clears throat> that works by uh, using linear algebra to perform a projection of the inputted features. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, after doing that, for each component, uh, you can rank the features according to how, uh, how much of that signal is captured for each principal component. This is a typical workflow for a PCA analysis, and uh, in the Virtualix platform, it's implemented where you can run PCA and immediately start to look at how each component captures the signal for a set of the features inputted to the PCA routine. The Virtualytics Patented Network Extractor is another unsupervised learning uh, machine learning technique that can detect patterns in your data. Similar to clustering, where we're looking for clusters of numerical features, the Virtualytics Network Extractor can look for clusters among your categorical features, detecting communities using multiple features, and then drawing edges between uh, those features to show relationships across your data. So this is especially useful and we've seen it uh, applied in understanding customer purchasing behavior based on multiple customer demographic features or categorical features, discovering which products are in the same communities of top selling uh, products allow you to identify product cannibalization uh, as well as opportunities to upsell and lastly, to create geospatial networks of supply chain, representing your data more naturally as how it is generated in the, in the world or in your business already. Uh, and so the virtual uh, network extractor does three things. One, it transforms your tabular data, the data that you're used to working with in a spreadsheet, into a network formatted data set. This is a data set that's comprised of nodes or points and edges or lines that connect these points. The nodes can represent entities in your data, say customer or products or uh, in the supply chain distribution centers or fulfillment centers uh, within life sciences. They can represent uh, different proteins and how they might upregulate or downregulate other proteins. We then visualize that network in our platform and spatialize it in 3D, providing you interaction and interpretation uh, that is unparalleled with other network platforms. You can spin the network around and see spatial relationships uh, across your data. 
We lastly pair this with our explainable AI, which is able to describe the relationships that define each community in your network graph. Uh, this enables analysts to jump in with normal spreadsheet data, extract a network graph, and then understand the relationships that are being detected in that new graph data. Again, this is useful in understanding the ideal buyer of a select product or to understand what customer, who is turning out, what customers, what are the characteristics and, and how you might uh, triage that and uh, target them with an, another marketing campaign. Explainable AI is applicable not just for network graphs, but uh, for all the routines. And we have a few features in our platform. Uh, here we have relative edge, uh, relative edge density, which is useful for explaining network graph relationships. We also have implemented uh, the identification tree method, uh, which helps to understand how categorical features are broken out uh, in segments of your data, and as well as the Kolmogorov Smirnoff test, which helps to summarize numeric distributions and summaries in your data as well. Explainable AI is a key component to data exploration because it's not just enough to generate these results from clustering, from network graphs, but it's also necessary to explain what those results mean. And Explainable AI can help with that. All right, thank you very much, Joseph. So uh, I should have mentioned earlier, we have a Q&A panel. If you have any questions about any of the techniques you've seen today, please uh, drop a question into the Q&A or question about anything else. This has been the first of our three-part series about moving beyond BI. And in our next session on this, we are going to dive in on how to use more practical applications of the techniques we just showed you, with the, export, um, the exception of network graphs. Network graphs, we're going to dedicate an entire session to. That will be our third session. Uh, simply because we, um, a lot of people don't have a lot of experience with network graphs. It is, I say, one of the, the best, least used uh, analytic technique out there. So uh, if you'd like to return and learn a bit more about practical applications of all of the techniques we just showed you today, please join us for part two in this series. And it will be uh, held on November 1st. And part three will um, that focus is, focuses just on network graphs will be held in December. And again, where we will dive in to how to use it, what it looks like, how to make sense of the information that's in there, and how you can apply it to other areas of your business to either make better decisions, to pull in the network graphs into um, a, as a feature for AI models. Uh, and so on, and how to get the most out of those. Again, if you have any questions at all, please drop them into the Q&A. We also uh, do have a, have a chat. Uh, this session has been recorded, and we will be sending out a recording to all attendees. We will also make a PDF of the presentation available to you as well, if you would like to review any of the slides. The, uh, the statistics we talked about up front are from our CIO.com study. You can find that on our website, or again, we will share a link to that in our follow-up email. Uh, if we have no questions today, I'd like to thank you all so much for uh, sharing your time with us and learning more about um, how we can evolve the role of the data analyst and how we can use AI exploration techniques to do that. And I do hope we see you all on November 1st as we dive a little deeper into each of these techniques with live demos and uh, practical applications. Please come armed with your, with your questions and your tools. We'd love to hear from you. Now, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great rest of your week.